And there we go, we're recording. Uh, so I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I am with MTSU Online. I'm an instructional designer for those of you that don't know me, though a lot of you I feel like I've seen a lot. So it's great to see you again on this beautiful day. Uh, today we are going to talk a little bit about checklists and D2L and how we can use those to promote organization and accountability uh, in our classes. So before I get too far into that though, I did wanna make sure that y'all get a chance in the upcoming, there are lots of presentations uh, that are occurring to the LT and ITC. Um, there's some that are coming up that are part of the OER steering committee and a grant that MTSU got from TBR. And these presentations are part of OER. OER is Open Educational Resources, if you don't know. Um, and just as a little side to that, part of what these grants are for to give you some background information and prepare you for an upcoming application process that you might be able to get some funding through that grant to put open educational resources in your classes. So um, more and more information will be coming about that, but just kind of stick that in the, the back over there of information that you should know that there is a potential for some, some financial resources coming your way to put open educational resources in your class. So keep an eye out for those presentations. Um, there's a couple others coming up. Then the next one I know that I'm doing is uh, in early March, the first week of March, and it's actually on gamification. Um, and I'm going to give a little pitch on gamification. I think gameful learning is awesome. Uh, and it is such a great way to engage students in active learning and authentic assessment and really give them a chance to utilize resources and information that's out there in a different way. So um, I'm not going to go too heavy into gamification today because I'm talking about it in a couple of weeks, but I'm also not going to go to the point in a couple of weeks that it will overwhelm you. It really is like basic, basic information on gamification. So I just wanted to throw that out because I'm excited about it. Um, so to get started on today, we are going to be talking about a checklist. So let me go ahead and do a little bit of screen sharing and then show you my little presentation. All right, here we go. There it is, okay. Um, so as the case with me typically in these presentations, um, my PowerPoints are only like four or five slides long because I'm not really the world's biggest, yeah, you go PowerPoint person. Um, but I know that people like to have a little something to look at and it gives you something after the presentation if you want it, the links are in it and there's some additional information you can go back and look at. Um, so MTSU Online is who we are. Today's presentation is on checklists on promoting accountability and organization in your online and remote courses. This information can also go into your face-to-face -face classes, so don't feel like you aren't going to be utilizing this in those when those start back up full force soon because we're headed that way, right? Hopeful. Um, so you can use these there. Uh, we're really just kind of targeting towards online and remote because that's now and you can put them in your classes right now. Uh, by the conclusion of this workshop, you should be able to identify what you need to know to util utilize checklists. Demonstrate and integrate checklists into your courses. Feel confident using checklists in your courses and promote organization and motivate students toward academic accountability. So y'all gonna have to check me on those later and make sure I did it. So I'm filling what I'm supposed to be doing. So why do we use checklists? Um, the title of promoting this is, uh, the title of this presentation is on promoting accountability and organization. And I wanna pause and ask y'all a question as to whose accountability and organization? Anybody have any insights on that, on who we might be talking about? Feel free to unmute um, or anything. Oh, and I totally forgot before we go on. Tara is monitoring the chat. So if you have questions about checklists as we go, Tara is monitoring the chat. I'm sorry, Tara. <laughs> um, but does anybody have any idea who I'm talking about in terms of promoting accountability and organization in our online and remote courses? Well, we're looking at SAS accreditation standards for when we have our five-year review, and we're hoping we can build some of those automatically into checklists. Yo, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, there's also some cool learning competencies in the back end of D2L that um, check with us later, and we might be able to show you how to do that because it can produce some 
raw data for you, which might be nice as you go through accreditation. So check with us at a later point and we can talk to you a little bit about that. Um, what, what else might we be talking about with accountability and, and organization? I think it's both the professor and the student. It's to keep uh, both accountable and, and organized and on task. Yes, it is. Um, and I kind of wanted to make sure that we knew that kind of going into it. It's not just students and it's not just faculty. It's actually all of us um, really making sure that we're prepared and we know what we're getting into with our classes uh, and how we're helping our students get to the greatest level of learning and application of said learning. And to do that, we as faculty also have to be a little more organized and we have to hold ourselves accountable for that too. Uh, I am right now in the process of developing a couple of courses for online through a couple of different colleges. Um, and I keep having to go back and, and think about things and really make sure that I am thinking about everything from all the different perspectives and not just the one. How am I holding myself accountable to this? How am I promoting organizations in my course? How am I promoting that organization for my students? And how am I going to hold my students accountable? Um, so that really is it's kind of where I'm coming from with the, the checklist ideas. So we thrive on structure in our online and remote classes. Um, we need to know what we're doing and when we're doing it and how we're doing it. Um, I think that probably within a lot of face-to-face -face classes, it's, it's been a while since I taught in a face-to-face -face class, but in a lot of face-to-face -face classes, we prep before we go in to uh, teach on any given day that we have that face-to-face -face class. We, we sit down and we think about it. We know what we're going to be talking about. We kind of go over a little bit of, you know, where, where are we going to go with this conversation? What are some of our additional response prompts that we're going to do if we're having a class discussion? What key points am I going to focus on? We do that before we go into the classroom. It is exactly the same in remote and online. The biggest difference with online and remote is this with online because it's a full semester or term course is approved before the class ever even gets started. We have to think about every single thing we're going to do in the class long before the class actually happens and how we're going to go about doing that. Uh, so it really is about thinking about how things flow, how things go from one thing to the next, how we can make um, different processes and steps and and all of those things occur within our class and really keep things in that organized manner. If we don't, we have a tendency to float into a cognitive overload kind of an area with our students and with ourselves. We start to hold ourselves to a standard of I have to do all of this. All of this stuff is important. They have to know every single thing. Do they? Do they need to know every single thing that's in that textbook? Do they need to know every single thing that you know about that topic during this class? Or is this one class of many that they're going to learn on this topic? Or is this a foundational class that they need to know these things in order to move forward and apply and process the information for their next course? And that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking about with these things. All right. Have you ever had a student ask, what do we do next? I was confused by the next step or what to read or do or worse. And this is the one that really gets me. I was overwhelmed by the information in the course and I gave up. So I hope that that has not happened to anyone. Um, I will tell you, I've seen some classes that it overwhelmed me as an instructional designer when I saw the information in the course. And I wasn't sure where to go. I wasn't sure uh, what direction the faculty was trying to take the student. Um, I was confused. So I'm not likely to give up. That's part of what I do. But if I'm feeling that, then there's a really good chance that a student is going to feel that in the class too. If they go in there and it's just lots of information, but we don't know where to start and we don't know where to go. And we don't have any kind of steps to tell us go here and then here and then here we're really kind of missing that opportunity to help them go through that process. Um, I kind of want y'all to think back. I don't know if any of you have been uh, to any of the presentations or um, or not, but if you get a chance, go back and take a look at um, Kevin Crambule's backward design presentation. It's on the LT and ITC YouTube or it's on the Stay On Course faculty page. 
as well as the one that I did on alignment of student learning outcomes. Um, I'm not like self-promoting on this one. I think it's just good to kind of have that as a background and a framework into what it is that we're talking about. It's about thinking about where you're going and how you're going to get there. How are our activities aligned? How are things in our class progressing from one step to the next? Uh, and I know I like to talk about student learning theory um, a lot because it's what my background is. So I, I think it's important that we bring it into every presentation. So I promise I won't talk about it forever because uh, I know y'all are here to learn how to use checklists. But I think it's also important to know why these things matter, uh, why these tools exist in D2L and why we promote them um, in MTSU Online and in Instructional Design. So the really short abbreviated version of Brunner's theory of scaffolding is that this is where we chunk information we streamline the information in a manner that allows the students to focus on acquiring a new skill or knowledge. It's what makes it manageable. It takes these huge concepts and we chunk it out and we build it in a way that we can accomplish whatever this goal is that we're trying to get to. Uh, and it's based in part on Vygotsky's zone of uh, proximal development. And that's where we structure the the instruction to take a student from they can't or they don't know they've never experienced it before they've never heard it before all the way through to can do it independently and providing those steps and those instructions along the way to build that confidence in the activities and the learning so in those two i i hope i think i summed up why checklists are so beneficial and how they can make such a huge difference for faculty and student accountability and organization. If we're thinking about our instruction in terms of the steps that our students need to take, in terms of how they build from one concept to the next concept until they get to a point of knowing and, and being able to explain knowledge or demonstrate knowledge, then we've done a great service for them. And using those checklists is one of the easiest ways to get there in our class because we really can say, one, two, three, this is how you get to this point. So on that, let's let's figure out how to do checklists. So um, I tell y'all to do this, I think in every presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell y'all to do this now. Feel free to minimize, um, pat us over in the corner. Uh, you can still hear my voice, good or bad. Uh, you can still hear my voice, but you don't necessarily have to see me because what you wanna see is the screen. And I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step how to create these checklists. And I would love for you to do it with me in your D2L shell. So go ahead and log into D2L uh, and get into one of your classes. And we are gonna create a checklist so that you're here live with us and we can talk about it. So if you run into any issues or you have questions, we are right here and we can answer them in real time instead of you trying to remember what I said later. Uh, so we're gonna do that right now. Oh, and before I do that, this little checklist. How about if I send that to y'all ahead of time? Wouldn't that be nice? I'll send I got that it. to you ahead of time. Oh, uh, never mind. Tara's got it. Ooh, she's awesome. Right. We should keep her. Um, so there's a checklist cheat sheet too. Uh, so that will get you uh, that information as well in case you you are someone who wants a checklist as we go through the checklist. Okay, so let's log into a class. Um Uh, is my font big enough? Sometimes it doesn't. Can y'all read it okay? It looks can like you make it a little bigger. Yep. How about that? Is that good for everybody? Yeah, that should be better. Okay. Okay, so the way that we're going to get to our checklist, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. Um, you can go through edit course, which is over here on the right hand side. And you can click on checklist, uh, or if you know, hey, look, gamification. Um, or if you know where you are going to put your checklist and you know what you want to do, go ahead and go to that content page. And then we go to new. And we scroll down until we find the one that says new checklist. And my computer is very slow today, so sorry about that. Uh, so one tip if you are doing this in an active class that you have right now like you are in your spring 2021 class building this checklist 
this little spot right here over to the left hand side right under title where it says hide from others go ahead and keep it hidden because you don't want to freak your students out by having something show up in their class that they don't know what it is so go ahead and leave it hidden we'll build it i'll show you how to unhide it at a later point um kim yes where did you get to that page? I'm in my, <laughs> my D2L. Sure. Under content? Yep, I did it under content and I'll just create a new one. Um, so I'm actually in my second module because that's just one I know doesn't have a lot in it. Um, it's the second module and then you go to new, which is right underneath the title. Um, and you can do it from any module that you're in. It's right underneath the title and then click on new and scroll to where it says new checklist. Okay. All right, so here's what our initial checklist looks like. Um, this is the that basic first page that it comes to. So we're going to give it a title because as with things in D2L, if you don't give it a title, it gets mad at you. And there's no way that I'll get to this without misspelling something. So please just know that um, I type. I, my typing and my brain aren't always in sync. Uh, so as I mentioned, if this is in an active class, if it is in a spring 2021 class, go ahead and leave it hidden. You don't want your students to see it as you're developing it. You can unhide it at a later point and they'll be able to see it. But if you're working on it, you don't want them to be like, what is that? You may not have anybody in there today because classes are canceled today, but just in case, we don't want somebody to get in there and freak out. So in the instructions part, the way to think about the instructions part of a checklist is that it's similar to the description that you would put on a quiz or a discussion. Uh, it's called instructions, but it really is a description box on checklists. So here you would put, um, if, and you don't actually have to put anything, just so you're aware, this is like the one time I say you don't have to, but um, in checklists you would say, um, this is the order of information for this module, check boxes as you complete tasks. Okay. So we now have a title, we're going to leave it hidden, and then we have some instructions. And then we simply just hit save. And this is what pops up when we do that. So this is now our actual checklist. This is what your checklist looks like when you create it. It has that title that you created, and then it says add a new list. So we're going to click on that, and it's, it's not a button, it's an actual space. Um, so kind of mouse over it until it changes and allows you and gives you that little little finger pointer so that you know that it's an active space. Click on add a new list. Now it says list one. I am a big advocate of naming things other than list one. So um, typically in my courses, I will name my checklist itself checklist for module one or checklist module two or something like that so that when the student is looking at it, they know they're on the right checklist. But then for this part, I actually remind them of what my academic content is for that week. So if we are talking about snow that week, then I would actually name this snow. So my module is talking about snow and other winter activities. This would be snow and ice. Uh, and that is because I always link it back to the academic concept. I want them when they're looking at this to remember every time they see it, what it is that is the main academic component for the week. I'm always focusing on that academic component. So snow and ice. Now, if I decide later that I don't like calling it snow and ice, you can simply mouse over where it says snow and ice, click on it. It highlights it. You can now change the name to anything that you want to change it to. All right, so to add a new task, adding a new task in a checklist, you simply click where it says add a new task and a new task pops up. It's called task one and it has a little check mark next to it. That's just to let you know that when you log in as a student, this will be a check box that the student can actively check. Um, that's all that that check means. It doesn't mean that you've completed it. It doesn't mean any of that. 
Now I wanna show you a few things just in this first task. So right here, you can change the name of the task. You can change it to anything that you wanna change it to. I don't change it because it will automatically, when we add another one, add it as task two and then task three. If you change it, then you have to go in and change it for all of them. So just kind of know that that's kind of just a, if you really don't like the word task, go for changing it, but I recommend just leaving it the same. Now on that, I have seen a few where people will change this to the activity that they want the student to complete. I don't do that either. I leave it as task because where that add a description is, when you click on add a description, it's one of those awesome dialog boxes that pops up all over D2L where you can do anything in the world that you want in that dialog box. So I leave it as task one or task two or task three. And then I use the dialog box to tell the students what it is that I need them to do first. So for this one, for example, I would say, um, please review the Hi, I told y'all the syllabus. Okay, so we're going to review the syllabus for this course. That is the activity that we're going to have them do very first. Now, here's the really awesome thing about this dialog box. You have a couple options. You can click on this link, go to your course files. I hope there's a, this is when we're going to find out if there's actually something in here I can link. Um, we're going to use the tools and tips because there's not a syllabus in this one. So you can link it in there. So it's just like that. It is, you just added a document into that box. It's there, it's ready to go. Or you can highlight the word and link it directly into the word. Um, with a file, it's not quite as big of an issue for it to be embedded in the word. If you are linking a website, you need to embed it in the word for accessibility purposes so that a screen reader isn't reading https colon slash slash www.mtsu.edu slash all of those things that it goes out after a web address. If you embed it, the screen reader will actually tell them that it is an active link on that word. So it will tell them where they're going and it's an active link. So that's just something to think about. So I want to show you what this looks like now that we have created this task. We now have task one, it is review the syllabus. The syllabus is linked. I, I can click on that and it will take me to that document in the class. So it's kind of nice, right? Clicks right away. If you change the name up here to please review the syllabus, you cannot link your syllabus. The student has to leave the checklist and go find the syllabus. So you are actually limiting the number of steps that they are having to take to find their resources if you use that description box. You will also see at a due date here, that is for you. Um, you are welcome to do due dates in your checklist. Just remember if you have due dates on your activities and you add it in your checklist, it will show up twice. It will show up as part of the checklist and it will show up as part of the activity. So I don't always use the due date because I actively place due dates on my um, assessments in the course instead of on the checklist. Um, but that really is up to you. So let's go ahead and add a second task because I really do want to show you how to do some of these things. So we're going to add a second task. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. I just wanted to jump in and add real quickly too that if you do add a due date to a checklist and you don't change the name, the due date shows up on their calendar as task one. Oh yeah. So that's kind of an issue too. That's another reason why we recommend not using due dates directly in the checklist because then you would have to change all the names otherwise the students would just know task something is due. Yes, okay, thank I'm you. Done. Sorry about that. No, I forgot about that. So thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so let's, we're going to add another activity here. Um, watch video. All right, so we're going to come up here and we're going to insert some stuff. We're going to see if I have any video notes in this class. I do, look at that, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Look, me making funny faces. <laughs> 
So here are some videos. So I am going to um, throw this one in there. So I'm just going to link on this one. And then I hit next. There it is. I insert it. And there's my video. It's active right there in the, it's active right there. So when the student sees it in the checklist, they'll see task one, I review the syllabus, I click right there. Oh, I need to watch this video. And you click right on the video, right in the checklist, and it's right there. I'm not gonna make y'all watch it. Um, but yeah, that's how, that's how easy it is. It's the same way as that dialog box everywhere else. So when you're creating a new video note, or um, you have a YouTube video that you want to link, or a document that you want to share with students, you can go in there and put every single piece of information into that checklist. It makes it so that your class is step by step by step by step. It gives a student the opportunity to really see what they're doing next. It also has that amazing chance. And if you've had a chance to look at the checklist that Tara, I think added to the chat, I haven't looked at the chat yet, but that I think was added to the chat. It tells you at the bottom that one of the great things about creating checklists too, is it gives you a chance to go back and double check all of those resources in your class, all of the information that you're providing and make sure that you didn't forget something and make sure that things are in there in the order that you actually want them to do step by step by step to create a new level of learning and a, a new place that they go. So um, one side note, um, I tend to do one checklist per thing. Um, so, and what I say about that is you may in the back of your mind be thinking, oh, I could do a checklist that I put all of my assessments on a checklist. That is a lot on one checklist and that can kind of overwhelm people. So earlier when I talked about chunking, keep things reasonable, um, keep things kind of smaller in terms of the amount of content that they're processing or you're gonna get some of that overload. If somebody goes in and, and sees something that says, um, course assessments and there's 27 things listed it's going to freak them out just a little bit even though there may be 27 in the class if we see them over the span of the semester 27 things isn't quite as overwhelming as 27 things the first day um so kind of thinking about how we're going to chunk that so it's not quite as big also you can add additional checklists within so remember how I said this is list one and I named it snow and ice. You can add a second list within that initial, this is my example. Think about why you're doing that uh, and what its purpose is. Um, I, I don't tend to do it. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just creates a different level for me and it can confuse it. Um, so think about why. Is there a reason that you need to add a second list within this checklist instead of adding a new checklist? Because it's just a little bit easier to process. Um, it's a little easier for students. It's a little easier for you to make changes if you need to make changes to it. And then you can actually embed your checklists at various places within your course content. It's not all in one that they're having to go back and forth. You can actually create smaller opportunities for learning and organization and processing information instead of one really, really, really big uh, checklist. So just kind of think about that as you're looking at some of these different options. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, I'm sure that Tara has been monitoring it like crazy because um, she's awesome at that, but question. I wanted to go ahead and open it up for questions. Yes. There's one question that we had in the chat that was actually requires you to show and tell. Can you show faculty how they can get to a checklist to rearrange it if they if the order is wrong? Right, because you can't just drag and drop in a checklist. Can drag and drop in a checklist. You're right. <laughs> okay, that is such a great question. Okay, so we're gonna go. Okay, so from edit course. There it is. It's under assessments. 
That is the other place that you can find checklists. And when you click on it, the checklists in your class open up. Pretty cool, right? So if we click on this one, which is the one that I was just building for you, the checklist components show up, the checklist content show up. So that gives you that name and that description. You remember earlier when I said instruction is description. If you go to it through checklist, this is what it will show you. So if you scroll down this page, um, so just let's go back just so you know where, how I got here. So from edit course, we clicked on checklist, it's under assessment. And then we clicked on the actual checklist that we want to reorder. It shows us our contents and then we will go to the a little further down the bottom and right here is where we can add a new item directly from here or we can reorder from here. So reorder if you want to reorder you simply click the little box next to the area that you want to reorder and you can click either up here at categories and items or you can click right there um, and then click reorder. It now shows you similar, I, I don't know how many of you have reordered discussions or drop boxes or grades or things like that. It's the same concept. So it just gives you the opportunity to kind of move things around um, and changing their order. So say I want this to be one and that to be two now, um, then I would simply reorder them and then save it. Now, we'll give you a second and let you see it. I also, while it's going to this point, would give the tip that if you know the order of the, check of the checklist that you want it to be in, but you have to change that order, change your task names to the order that you want. So whether, say, task one, for example, you want it to be task two, mm -hmm. go ahead and change those. So when you get to the reorder page, you remember the order that you want the checklist task yes. to be in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, if you realize that while you're building your checklist that you're going to want to reorder them, don't don't go through and copy, cut, paste, delete, rearrange all that stuff in your checklist. Go ahead and just keep going, but remember to go back and change your task name uh, while you're on that checklist page so that when you go to reorder, you will reorder them in the correct order. Um, otherwise, you're you're moving stuff around all over the place and recreating and that just that'll that's it's work and stress and nobody has time for stress. So, um, so just kind of try to remember if you realize, oh, I want to add a task or, oh, I want to um, change the order that these three are in, go ahead and leave them in that order as you were developing them. Just go ahead and change your task names before you go to the reorder page. What, if, if you don't, you can do it from here. Um, There you go. It'll take you right there and you can do it from there too. Uh, but it's a little bit easier on the checklist page. What other questions do y'all have before I go to one last question that I have for y'all? Because I want to make sure that we've done all the screen share before I go to the next thing. Are there any other show and tell questions that y'all have? Uh, one question yeah. that Dr. Martintail just asked was yes. if you could reiterate why you would use task one, task two, task three, instead of changing the names of the yeah, tasks. Sure. Uh, it's, well, for me, uh, what it is, is that uh, if you, if you change it, you have to go through and change them all. So that kind of creates an extra step for you. But the number one reason that I leave them is task one, task two, task three, instead of changing them to review syllabus or uh, post in discussion or reply in discussion is they are not dialogue box items. They are just titles. So if you want to uh, link the syllabus or you want to link to the discussion board or you want to embed a video, you got to use that dialogue box that's the add a description box instead of the title that is task one or task two. So it really just creates greater opportunity for usability for you as uh, a faculty member and that creates a greater opportunity for students to be able to see things 
in one place uh, and a flow of information without having to go back and forth. Um, the more back and forth that students do, the more likely they are to miss a step. So if things are in that dialogue box, it is just right there, right there, right there. If they have to go search for it, they may not find it or they may get frustrated. Uh, so really helping them have that in the same place helps them quite a bit. Um, and then it also helps you keep everybody in the same place at the same time. What other questions y'all have? Kim, couldn't I keep them in the, uh, you know, and avoid that going back and forth and still have the task name like read syllabus or something like that? In other words, the task is named read syllabus, but then in the description, I have text that says read the syllabus and then a link to the syllabus. I mean, and the reason could. I'm thinking that is like if I, then if I had to reorder later, I don't have to rename my tasks. You know, if I, if I actually made task three to be the first thing, I wouldn't have to rename the task. It would still just say, you know, read syllabus or you know, something like that. Sure, but that's actually creating work for you. So if you are waiting until after you have figured out exactly what you want to have happen in your class and the flow of information in your class, if, it, if the checklist is the very last thing that you're doing, which is what we actually encourage it to be, is the last thing that you do uh, when you're putting your information in your course, then if you are changing your task order, it is probably only one or two that are having to change um, or having to reorder because you have really thought about how your course is gonna lay out. If you go through and you rename all of them, just in case you have to reorder later, you've actually just created work for yourself because you had to rename them in the first place. So it, it really is up to that individual. I don't change it because I feel like it creates an extra step for me. But if it makes sense to that faculty member, then that's that's what makes sense. So you got to do what makes sense to you. Right. Okay. For me, it, that's an extra step of I, I don't plan to have to reorder my tasks. So if I'm changing it in case I have to reorder, I'm just creating extra work for me. Very good. That's, at some point, can you show an example of from the student's point of view of what that the checklist looks like? Or maybe you're yeah. going to do that eventually. Yeah, I yeah, I was going to do that. I would also. Uh, Oh, do sorry. I, I was just going to say, I would also add too, from that standpoint, it takes out any ambiguity for students for them to understand you want them to do things in a certain order if that number is there. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no question I should actually do things in the, in the way that they're ordered. Because we know sometimes people with lists, they like to jump into the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of takes that ambiguity out. I will say um, that there's been one question about release conditions on checklists. Um, if you could maybe show a little bit about that. Sure. Well. I, yeah, I can. Um, I want to show y'all from a student perspective what a checklist looks like. Um, so this, this course is not quite finished yet, so no judgment. <laughs> um, there's a couple of things that are missing from it. So, um, and you'll see what's missing from it actually. So, uh, part of what I wanted to show you too with this one is so this is a, a course in the higher education doctorate program. Um, and you will notice that there's, there's five content items between the five units in this program. Um, and each course in the program is set up exactly the same way. This was the way they decided to set it up. So this is the way every class in the program is set up. So the only content in the unit is the checklist. Um, so this is what a checklist looks like from a student's perspective. Uh, so task one, select learning theory you wish. Discussion, y'all can read the information if you want to, but um, this is where I want them to post in this discussion. Here's some information about learning theories, discussion topics. It's all right here in the same area. Now, once I've done that and I click this, it tells me that I'm done. Um, it is not an auto-complete. And the, the reason for that, uh, and this is kind of an important task because people ask me a lot why it doesn't auto-complete. So just because I click on something in this checklist doesn't mean that I've finished it. So if it auto-checks as a student, I might think, oh, I already did that. I have to go in and manually check that I have completed this task for it to show up as complete at the top. Um, so it really just kind of provides them a little bit of extra 
information and kind of following up with themselves. Um, the next one was that they are supposed to select a role um, in the second discussion activity that they're doing. So right here, you will see that role is highlighted. Um, and I actually put the roles in a second location as well. I actually put them in both locations because this is the first unit for the class. Um, and I hope that the other IDs are looking at this because I'm going to need y'all's feedback later on this class. Um, so you can get to it through clicking on role or from discussion group roles. So when you click on role, it actually takes you straight to the document. Well, it opens the document right there. So it's a little slow. Sorry, my computer is very slow today. So there is the that document. And that is the roles that the individuals would be participating in in the discussion. Um, this discussion functions a little bit like a faculty book group, just so y'all know. Um, this is the part that I said is missing. <laughs> Somebody's got to finish captioning some videos. I don't know who that could possibly be. Um, so, <laughs> so this is the basically what it would look like. So you can see from here, I also have, um, I want you to read these, the textbook. Here's a, a video or two I want you to take a look at. Um, here's some additional information that leads to another video um, and why it is that I want you to watch this video. And for me, in this one, the overall was I gave them more information here, partially because it's of the checklist and the way that the department has things set up, but it's to kind of prepare them for what is coming later in the class. Like you're going to have to do this later in the class. So here's why I have you watching this video now. Um, and somebody should tell Kevin that I totally stuck his video in the middle of the class. Um, and then, oh, you got to go back and submit that presentation that we talked about in step one. You actually have to go submit it to the discussion board now. Um, and then the rest of the class activities and assessments. And then I usually in my checklist, if it is a module checklist that, or a unit checklist that leads to a next group, I actually usually put the very last one on that checklist is go ahead and begin working on the next activity for your next one. And also here's how you get to that next unit uh, and direct them there. So as you can see, everything is in order. Um, and as the student completes the task, and they check off the little box, it actually tells you how much complete your checklist is and kind of keeps you structured and in order um, and in that process to do things. Uh, so that is the student's perspective. Does anybody have any questions about that? Kim, would you say it's kind of a general good practice to essentially use your, and I, I used to write these extensive like, you know, descriptions in an individual module. Oh, hey, today you're going to do this and this and, you know, a lot of Instead, just use this checklist and then use the spaces in the checklist to to elaborate and get that sort of teacher presence in there. Is, in other words, is there, I, I guess there's reasons not to, but this, this certainly seems convenient and straightforward. Yes. So I actually use the checklist for a lot more of that information than I do the description. Yeah. Um, and I can actually just leave me on student and let you see what I actually use the description area for. So my description area um, in class, in classes that, that I develop or in classes that I work with people on, I really actually encourage the, this area to be much more dedicated to some basic information uh, because I like using the checklist. If you're going to not use a checklist and you want to put that information there, you are welcome to put it there. Um, it makes it very long. So the longer the information is in that description at the top, the longer it takes for you or the student to get to the first learning resource. And if they're looking at it on a phone or on uh, an iPad um, or an Android or Google device, um, all of that wording can take up a whole lot of that screen and they have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. And after a while, people just scroll and they don't necessarily pay attention to what's in the scroll and then stop the screen when it gets to whatever they think is the first thing that they need to do. So if we keep that description area a little bit more concise and then put the information into the checklist, it's it's easier to convey that information and people are less likely to scroll past it because it's not just words, task, 
um, its task with some words and task with some words. So it's a little bit more manageable, especially on a mobile device. Um, and while we would all wish that our students would not take classes on their iPhones, um, we know that several are. Um, and so if we can help kind of meet them where they are with that and provide the learning content in a way that better helps them, I think that's probably the better way to do it. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. What other questions does anybody have? We've got a couple minutes, but I did have one other thing. So I'm actually going to um, minimize this and we're going to go back to our little presentation and then we'll still have time for questions. So um, I did want to ask y'all what some, uh, in addition to overall course and content flow, um, how else do you see checklists being used in your course? Can you think of other examples of processes or places, um, how you would use it that wasn't necessarily for overall course or overall module, but are there other specific things that you think you might could use a checklist? Just to list due dates, I think would be a good, a good way to use it. Yeah, if you wanted to. How else? What about culminating projects? Does anybody have culminating projects in their classes or really involved projects or activities in their classes? Um, has anybody ever used a checklist to kind of map that process for the student as to the overall steps that they would be taking to get there? I haven't used it for this. I haven't used it at all. That's why I'm taking the class, to be <laughs> honest. But um, I can see how this would be helpful in an MT Engage class because um, their signature assignment is not due until April, but there's steps that they're supposed to be taking all along. And right now, yeah. while they can't actually engage in the community because of COVID, they're doing things like um, interviews, uh, in death and dying, they're interviewing people who are grieving and in developmental psychology, they're, they're um, interviewing grandparents and that kind of thing. But I get questions, I've gotten questions already this semester about, I see in your schedule where we're supposed to be interviewing somebody. Why am I interviewing somebody? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I can see if they had a checklist, it might help them see how everything fits together. Uh, yeah. because even though I explain that in multiple places and and felt like I put a lot of good detail. It's, you know, it's overwhelming the first of the semester and it's, and they're struggling to see what it's even about. So I can see how that would be helpful in an MT Engage class to see how all the steps fit together and to make them feel like they're on target because they are, but they just don't feel like it. <laughs> or many of them are. Yeah. Yeah, that is actually the one I was hoping somebody would get there with that and thinking about how that might work because to me, that's actually one of the, the great ways to use it. If you don't feel comfortable using it as like a checklist for your overall uh, module yet, um, you know, you don't, that's not quite where you are, but if maybe start working on it with something like a culminating project or an activity that there really are a lot of steps. And in order to get to this next step, there, there's got to be some level of, of that foundational information has to be gathered in order to get to the next step and really helping them do that. That's part of that scaffolding I talked about earlier. It's, mm -hmm. it's part about getting them from the can't to the can do independently as um, Bogoski mentioned in the zone of proximal development. You know, really thinking about how are we helping get our students to that place? Um, and especially in online and remote, um, remote more so than online, but uh, a lot of times in distance courses, you don't actually get to see your student staring at you confused um, because we don't have as many, right? We've all seen that look where they kind of tilt their head a little bit and then like an eyebrow goes up and they're like, what? Um, you don't get to see that as much, especially in an asynchronous online class. So a lot of these things help them feel more confident and it actually leads to you being able to provide a lot more information in a way that can reinforce where it is that you're trying to go with your activities and reinforce the information that you're giving your students without you having to send 20 email responses to basically the same question um, or sending, um, you know, 
announcement after announcement trying to explain something. If you can have some of this stuff up front in that step-by-step -step process for the students in a checklist, they really can start wrapping their head around how are we going to get there and why are we taking these yeah. steps to get there. And that why is huge. And that why really does help students with that accountability because if they know why they're doing something, they're so much more likely to do it. I mean, same with us. I'm, yeah. Maybe not y'all, but same with me. If I know why I'm doing something, I'm so much more motivated to do it um, than just because I said so or just because we've always done it that way. But why am I doing this and what value does it have for me and my future? And that promotes active learning and authentic assessment and accountability and student engagement, which are all the things that we're striving for in all of our courses, but especially in remote and online to really make that connection with our students and with making sure they're getting to where we want them to get with the course learning outcomes. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah. my, one of my classes, the class I'm designing uh, for online delivery actually is, uh, includes two research papers and a project to build a glider. And that involves, all of, all of those things involve steps. Mm -hmm. So I can see where this would work very well in a, an asynchronous online class where I could actually go back and check each student's checklist under, under class project, uh, class mm -hmm. progress or student progress. Yes. Yeah, you can. And, and make sure that they're, they're checking them off. Um, right now, you know, in an in-person class or even a synchronous online class or remote class, I'm ha I have to ask everyone, hey, are you doing this? I, I, have you purchased your supplies for your project? Um, have you uh, done your research? Have you looked into this? So there are, there, I can see where this would be very, very good in an asynchronous yeah. class. I think that's a great idea, Bob. And also I have um, a class which um, has um, a simulation that is in a separate software. So in order to see what students have done, I have to go back and forth and, but even more, they also have to do the same thing. So when they finished all of the exercises um, for that particular unit, as I call it, mm -hmm. um, if they have them all checked off, then they know every time they look at it, that until they move to the next unit, that they don't have to, uh, to do any additional exercises outside of D2L. Uh, and I will also know that by looking into what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I can see well, uh, the one reason why I wanted to see about check checklists was to kind of keep up with that because the alternate software does not have any way of doing that other than just going in there and, and looking um, at the grading portion of that. Yeah, and that's hard for them too, to track their steps. You could actually have that D2L checklist open on one tab and the activity open on another one and just be able to go through and do step, 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 step and it just be right there and synced for them to be able to see as they're going, it could really make a difference for both of you. <laughs> right, <laughs> for all involved. <laughs> right, Kim, did you have a question? Oh, Kim, I um, thank you so much for this. I, I, I might've just blinked when you said it, but so let's say I've got a quiz mm -hmm. and before a student is actually able to even open the quiz, how do I block them? from that or not let them do that until, for example, they've clicked on the review objectives or they Oh, that's right. Y'all wanted to know about. Yes. Um, okay, sorry, release conditions. So let me let me end the show to get up. The only thing that was left was thank you for coming and a resource. Um, let me get back into my D2L. Okay, so uh, I'll Typically speaking, your release condition is actually on the quiz. So as long as you have your quiz locked, um, then they can't get into the quiz until uh, you're ready for them to get in there. But if you want them to have completed, I gotta make this bigger, that's too small. Um, if you want them to have completed the, um, like they need to read something in order for something else to happen. Again, I would actually attach it to the quiz, but you can do it in, um, in a checklist too. Um, 
one moment. Um, you would do it here um, on the activity. So if you wanted them, it's not as easy in the checklist to put a specific release condition. So it's a lot easier to put the release condition on the actual activity. So if you want them to be able to not see the quiz until after um, after they've completed reading a resource, then you would attach that release condition to it. Otherwise, it would actually run into steps that you'd need to start adding. You remember how it had list one and then list two and then list three and then list four. Um, if we create release conditions, we actually need to start heading into creating additional lists in order to get it to flow correctly. Um, so it's just kind of something to think about. Check checklists are pretty basic and straightforward. Um, most of those additional restrictions and things come on um, the actual assessment or activity. Now we can put one on an actual checklist itself. Um, by the way, those of you that made it hidden when you're ready to unhide it, go on the page that you have it on and literally just click that eyeball and turn it back on um, and it will turn it back on for you. Um, so. So Kim, so you're saying I actually answer your question. It's easier to attach it to the activity to, to the quiz than it is within the. OK, so quiz. not that I, I I don't care if they they see the quiz. I don't want them to attempt the quiz until they've completed or at least fooled themselves and click the, the something or another before they took the quiz. Do, right. do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I can do that in quizzes. OK, yeah, you can just do it. I'll show you really quick and um, you can do that in quizzes. So from any quiz that you're in or any anything that's okay. an activity or assessment really, um, you can actually put the restrictions on documents that you add or anything like that. Up there where it says restrictions, right down here at the bottom is where you would attach existing mm -hmm. or create and attach. Okay. Um, so with this quiz, we would create that um, I wanted them to complete a checklist item um, or complete a checklist. Like it, it, it may, it's easier to do it from this direction than it is to try to do things within the checklist. So you would complete the checklist item and attach that in there. And when you do complete the checklist item, it asks me what checklist, well, I wanna do it for my sample checklist presentation and then what checklist item. So you can embed it all the way down to that one individual task that they have to have at least done what they were supposed to do with this, this thing in order for your quiz to open. So in That's this perfect. situation, if you're using a checklist, it completed means that they have manually checked that checkbox. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Does anybody have any other questions? Our presentation probably at this point is over because I think we're a little bit over time. But as is the case, usually um, we will stop recording here shortly. Um, but you've got your IDs here. So if y'all have any questions or you need anything from us, we'll stick around for a little bit to answer any questions that y'all might have. But thank y'all so much for coming today. Um, we will send out all of these resources. Uh, we'll get them to Sheila so she can send them to everybody that's registered as soon as we can. So thank y'all again for coming today. I hope that y'all stay safe and warm on this lovely ice apocalypse day. Um, and thank Here. you. I'm going to stop. Kim, I just have a, a quick question, if you could. Mm -hmm. How did you get to the uh, release conditions uh, for that checklist?